Hi everyone and welcome to Carry Hope Ministries. I'm Pastor Martin. This is my wife Crystal and we're so glad that you decided to spend a few moments with us here during your busy week, busy Christmas time. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, we're going to really look at what most people think of as a conventional Christmas story beginning in the second chapter. So, before we get started, we want to remind you to make sure to do what whenever they're watching us? Say hello. That's right. Tell them how we want them to say hello. Don't just wave. We won't see that. If you would just type in hello, and and uh, if there's two of you watching, type in both names so we can say hello to both of you. Um, Very good. And we'll get to that. We like to say that because it helps us to know that there's somebody out there that is watching us. Excuse me just one second here. If I didn't stop the uh, music, we were going to have a problem there because it's going to go into some more into themes. Some more themes. <laughs> Anyhow, so again, we're having to work this with uh, just Crystal and I, and we had one grip that had to leave here for just a second. But get your Bible with, it, with us and look in Luke chapter 2. And we hope that already the Christmas season has been a great season for you. And we hope that tonight, as we continue our study, and again, we had five Thursdays uh, in which to share the Christmas story. We're trying to take it from beginning to end and give you sort of, I like to say it's a timeline of events. And of course, we began not with the birth of Jesus, but with the birth of? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. We talked about Zechariah. We talked about Elizabeth, his mother. And now she was beyond childbearing, childbearing years, excuse me. But nevertheless, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah in the temple, and he told him that they would have a child. Of course, Zechariah was somewhat doubtful, and therefore his voice was taken from him until the day in which he was dedicated at the temple and was given a name. Now, uh, we went on last week, and we talked about the dilemma that Joseph had because he found out that Mary was pregnant with child, of course, by that of the Holy Spirit. And uh, nevertheless, he went forth because he was spoken to, and he didn't. He wasn't visited by an angel, was he? I guess you could say he was. But how did the how did God speak to Joseph? Um, in a vision, in, in a, a dream, exactly. In a dream. And I find that very interesting because Gabriel would appear in physical form, I guess, to Zechariah and to Mary to announce the birth of their children. However, to get Joseph to take the child and to take Mary as his wife and take the child and flee to Egypt later on. He appeared to him in a dream. It's something that's very interesting. Now, tonight we're going to talk about, like I said, the more conventional Christmas story. So let's look at it together, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start right at the beginning of it in verse 1. But before we do that, remember we are Carry Hope Ministries, and we are a product of Gold Hill Wesleyan Church. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to join us. We have morning worship at 10 a.m., and most of the time it's live streamed. It's not going to be live streamed this weekend. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then at 6 o'clock... We are always online with prayer time, Lord willing, and on that is on Sunday. And then Car <laughs> Crystal and I are back for Carry Hope Ministries each Thursday night at 7 o'clock. We're just going to call this study the Blessed Event. We're going to look at verses 1 through 20 of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and we're going to talk about these characters as we've tried to highlight them throughout our studies this month, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, the shepherds, and the angels. And you know, whenever you think about this story, I can't help but think of Charlie Brown Christmas and Linus and the like whenever he gets to actually tell Charlie Brown what Christmas is all about. And uh, a lot of today's lesson is going to touch on that. But let's begin with chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. A couple things to point out about this. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, in some, uh, particularly the old King James Version, it would say, that there would be a tax that would be taken of the entire Roman world. And more than likely, that would be what would take place. Everyone who was under the rule of Rome was going to be counted probably for the purpose of taxation. Now we go on, says this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Why is this important to the Christmas story? You got any ideas on that before I share why I think it's important? Why you think it's why, important? Well, why well, I've read, I've cheated a little bit and gotten some input, but uh, why do you think it's important? I think it was important because um, God needed to get Mary and Joseph in a specific location. And uh, this was where kind of the crossroads of the world. Well, why do you think that, and I do agree with that 100%. Uh, we're talking about the locale that Jesus was born into, and he wanted to get him there from the very beginning. 
That's why, of course, he told Abraham to take this land. That's why he wanted Moses to bring them up out of Egypt to go back to this land of Canaan, which is where this is taking place. But do you have any ideas as to why it talks about Caesar Augustus and Quirinius? Specifically? I find this intriguing because it really doesn't talk a lot about these people in other areas of the Bible. You can say. You. Just, just from... Um a historical exactly uh, yes so you can look back and say hey when did these people rule yes it's not a situation it this takes it out of the arena for being biased simply because of a a view from the hebrew perspective or from the christian perspective this is giving it significance and value uh, whenever someone looks at it as a i guess if they want substance to prove that this actually happened at a particular time they can say, well, we can relate it to the time of Quirinius and Caesar Augustus, which gives us a secular influence yeah. upon the nations around it, which we can look at. We, you know, This had nothing to do with the Hebrew faith, had nothing to do with the Hebrew religion, but it makes it that much forceful because it reinforces the reality that this took place at this particular time when these people lived. Right. So that's what we're talking about. So let's go on. We've got this uh, taking place during this time. And it says, and everyone went to their own town to register. We'll talk about that just a little bit more. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Some people think it's the Galilee, and I like to think of it that way. For me, it makes it easier to understand, because I think of Nazareth as a town, a city in the Galilee, which is a region of Israel. And he went from there to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of and line of David. So what are we talking about? I hope you can see these maps okay, uh, at the way that they shine. I hope it's not too much of a glare in, the, in our uh, phone or in our camera. But if you look at this, we're up here in the north, we have Nazareth. And this is where, of course, Joseph lived. This is where Jesus spent a lot of his life. But nevertheless, because he was from the house and line of David, David's people were in Judah. And Judah was in this region where this little red dot is an in indicator of Jerusalem, which was, of course, the capital city, the center of uh, all the religious aspects of the Hebrew nation. Uh, I guess you could say prior to their division, don't want to get into all that. But whenever we think about it, he went all the way from Nazareth to this region in Jerusalem where David's people was. And then if you look at this map, I've got Jerusalem here and Bethlehem just a little southwest of Jerusalem. Not very far at all. But you do get the idea that Nazareth was in the very northern part, Jerusalem down here, and Bethlehem just beyond it. So they're going all the way from the northern part to the southern part of Israel. And the reason for this was because, as Crystal said earlier, God wanted his people in this region, uh, or he wanted specifically Jesus to be born in this region, because Israel in itself was the central location between Babylon and Egypt, the two great powerful nations that used this area as a trading route. So he wanted Jesus born in that locale because really it was the New York City or the stock exchange, if you will, of its day. You control this region, you control the world. Even though Rome was in power, Jesus was going to be born there. A lot of focus was going to be on this location. So you can see it's a significant trip from Nazareth down to Jerusalem. You got any idea how long it would take someone? And, and let me tell you this. They would usually cross the Jordan because this region was Samaria, and this was where the Samaritans lived who didn't really get along with the traditional Jews. So they would usually cross the Jordan, come all the way down, cross the Jordan again, and go back to Jerusalem. You have any idea on foot how long that would take? No. <laughs> Especially think about for a pregnant teenager and her husband at the time. And also was the Jordan... Did it at have blood, a stage. blood stage? We don't really don't know. know at this time of the year. You know, I, I have no way to, to know about you know because the flood stage usually comes whenever uh, the, the mountains, you know, the snow melts from the, the top of the, the highest locations in Israel. But just make a, a guess. You know how many days yeah. it would take? I was going to say we need the GPS for and the yeah, walking. Walking. How many miles? <laughs> oh, um, six. Okay, six days. That's yeah. very good. It's very accurate because. Scholars at first thought four days, but then they realized they would have to average two and a half miles an hour and just stop to sleep. They wouldn't take any breaks to eat, and they wouldn't take any breaks for, I don't know, bathroom or anything like that. So they, they said that's really pushing. That would be an average time, and that would really be pushing Mary. Yeah. And they thought if Joseph was sensitive, and they show up late, and, and all right. this is, 
They think it took him at least seven days to get there. Uh. So it was a very good guess. So he's coming from the northern part to the southernmost part, and the reason was to register. But that we know that wasn't really the reason. The reason was because God had said through his prophets in the Old Testament that he would be born in Bethlehem. It's told to Herod the king at that time. Uh, when the wise men come, he is told that Bethlehem is where the Messiah would be born and so forth. So this is the reason for it. And if you look at it again, and from historical facts, it was necessary that they register in that location in order to be taxed. From God's prophecy, it was necessary that he get there. So God is God uses everything to bring about his will. Even though you may not think he's in it, he is absolutely putting everything together to conform to his prophets and to his word. So we continue with chapter 2. It says, He went there to register with Mary, meaning Joseph, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Now, I, you know, a lot of scholars smarter than me can probably talk about this, whether they were married or not. We just know they were pledged to be married. As we talked last week, this usually took about a year. Um, you know, we don't know that they actually had exchanged vows yet, but nevertheless, he did not consummate the marriage, we are told, until after they were married and after the birth of the, of the child. So the time came for the baby to be born. Something you want to interject there? There was, uh, in one of the... In one of the <laughs> get you back in here. You back in, and I know that in one of the gospels it says Joseph took her into his home. Yeah. So even though they they did not consummate the marriage, uh, it in was some as though, cases that was part of truly being married and not just betrothed is to to take her into the take home. her into the home. And of course, we get a lot of prophecies about. Uh, the wedding supper of the Lamb and how he'll come back for his bride and so forth. So, yeah, it's an excellent point. We have that kind of taking place here. And while they're there, the time came, it says, for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths or some uh, translation, especially the King James, if you memorize it like I did. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room or no room available for them. And King James again, in the yeah. end. And so we've got a lot of hustle and bustle. I talked about this on Sunday in the sermon. There's a lot of crowds coming and going because not only was Mary and Joseph responsible to get to his hometown, everyone who had ever moved away from home had to relocate. And it wasn't as easy as it is now. They couldn't just hop in the Chevrolet or the Toyota and go be at mom's house within 30 minutes or an hour or two hours. It would take days. It would take a long period of time. And this commerce is going on. They're making sure that there's reservations and rooms that are being made. Um, I guess not reservations so much, but there had to be rooms. There had to be places to park any animals or beasts of burden that you might have at the time. A lot going on at this period of time. Uh, so there's no room for them. Obviously, they're probably late getting where they wanted to get at that particular time because, hey, it's a pregnant woman and, and it takes some time to get there. It said, but then I want us to go away from this scene and head out to the area nearby, the fields nearby, as it says. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Some translations again, he is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign, excuse me, I meant to, hang on, my computer here doesn't want to, but we've had some issues today. So, uh, come on now, start, don't stop working on me. Hey, you fill, do some filler here. <laughs> I was looking, I was going to grab a Bible. Here we go. Okay. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, or singing some translations, glory to God in the highest, highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests, or peace, or in, in, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, is another way to say it. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go, uh, let us go or let's go to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told 
uh, told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So let's summarize a little bit about what took place here. We And, and again, I don't want to... I mean, everybody's invited to look back at last week's sermon, which was about this particular passage. You can see it on our Facebook or YouTube uh, page. But uh, I just want to emphasize again that it's interesting what people will look down upon in the day. And I'm talking about the shepherds particularly, were exactly the people that were available for God to get his message across. How does that, how does that strike you when you think about the world today and, and the Christmas time today? Um, I think about the busyness because we're busy. I know everybody is busy at Christmas time. And it, it, uh, I think about how the shepherds were kind of in a way set apart from the rest of society because they did have to look after the sheep. It was a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week job. So they were kind of set apart from the crowd. They had come out from the crowd, and they were able to make time. They were kind of looked at as simpletons also amongst the people. You might be ashamed if you had a shepherd that was part of your family line. It was a very dirty job. It was uh, something that, again, though, it speaks to me in a sense that no matter who we are or what we do for a living, if we make ourselves available to God, and if we search for him, with all of our hearts, Scripture tells us that we'll find him, and he finds us. And it's interesting to me also, I think about the fact that it took place at night, the spectacular vision that they had is not beheld by others within the city. And you know how whenever you go camping or you get out of the, the limelight or the city, you can see the stars and so forth? I tend to wonder if, I know it wasn't nearly the metropolis that we think of today, but even Bethlehem had its preoccupied people, a lot going on and a lot taking place. People could have been asleep, several could have been, but they did not behold what the shepherds were able to behold. Another thing, we talked about being hurried and being busy, and I think it's funny to emphasize that the shepherds hurried to see Mary and Joseph and the baby, so they dropped what they were doing, they went very quickly to see him and to worship him and behold him. And then not only did they do that, but they went out and they shared the gospel message. And that's something that I think, sadly, at the Christmas time, we're guilty of not doing. We, we don't come, we don't behold him as we should, and then we certainly don't share him in every opportunity we, that we get because we're too worried about causing conflict. And, and I understand all that, and it's very important that we try to maintain good relations with our family, because that could get the door open to speak to them more in depth. But let's have Christ on our heart and on our minds during this Christmas season so that he will open the door and give us the opportunity. Hey, if he could arrange for his son to be born in Bethlehem when it looked like there was no way that was going to take place by a census and taxation and a virgin getting pregnant, if he could do all of this, then certainly he can open a door for you to speak to your loved one for Jesus. Let him speak to you, be available to him as the shepherds were, and rush to him. I think that's a great lesson for us during this Christmas season. Hey, and speaking of that, we want to say hi to some people. We do, and we, do. Uh, we can wish them a Merry Christmas and Happy Christmas season at this time. Let's okay. say hi. Well, first of all, let's say hi to Bonnie and Jamie. Hey, Bonnie and Jamie. Glad to have you guys with us tonight. And hi to Tony. Hey, Tony. We're glad you're with us as well. Thanks for joining us. Hi to Rhonda. Hey, Rhonda. Thanks for being there. Rhonda had said a teenager, pregnant or not, is the only ones that could walk that far. Could only ones that could walk that far. That's true. That's I mean, true. We see pictures of donkeys carrying Mary, but a lot of people think that that's just fiction. A yeah, lot, a lot of them think, yeah, she walked it too. <laughs> I did read a scholar today that said it might have uh, been bookends, Jesus going into the city mm -hmm. uh, uh, through Mary in Mary's womb on a donkey and then riding before he died uh, into the city on a donkey. Okay, but, that's again, that's conjecture. Nice. We don't know. It's a nice thought. It is a nice thought, but we don't know that. <laughs> um, hello to Dot. Hey, Dot. Thanks for joining us tonight. And hello to Charles and Betty. Hey, Charles and Betty. We're so glad you're with us as well. Okay. 
That it? That's it. Hey, if you didn't say hi, make sure you do it real quick before or right after we have prayer, we'll say hello to you as well. But we want to invite everyone, very important, that we have our Christmas play. The Goldale Christmas play is coming up this Sunday at 10 a.m. Unfortunately, it will not be able to be live streamed as we usually live stream our morning worship services. It has to do with some things, uh, some tracks and so forth that uh, are copyrighted and we cannot do that because it requires royalties and the like if we live stream it. So just keep that in mind. We would love, though, for you to join us at 10 a.m. at the church. It's just off of Highway 52 on Liberty Road in Gold Hill. Got a great cast, a great program, and I think it's going to be something you'll really enjoy. The children are going to be involved also, so make your plans to be with us this Sunday at 10 o'clock. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this time of the year. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for speaking to those who are anxious to hear from you. And we look at this story and we realize that there were some that were anxious to be obedient, some that were able to be reached by your word. And we pray we will have hearts that are of that mind and, and, and that are of that, uh, I guess, of that manner to where we're approachable with your Holy Spirit, with your word, and with your acts within our lives. We ask, Lord, that we be attuned to you and that this Christmas season we have you on our minds and take advantage of every opportunity to share what the season is all about. Again, we praise you for this magnificent event. We lift up the name of Jesus because it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, we want to say Merry Christmas to everyone. We hope that everyone has a very good evening. We hope you have a great weekend. And again, everyone is enjoying, in, invited to join us this Sunday at 10 a.m. at the church. Anyone say hello to Don? Okay. Have a good evening, everyone. God bless. See you soon.